Paul, take the mic away. All right. Well, I mean, we're very familiar with Gavin's deck. He really destroyed me with all the initiative stuff. But Reed, you had a chance to play against Nathan. What is he really trying to do with his deck? Nathan is um, kind of what I would describe as like an old school style Esper control, you know, like a blue white, like a blue white Chion's kind of deck. <laughs> um, but these days, I think the um, that, that those decks tend to take a little bit of a different form just because the power level of the creatures has gone up so much that you never really play pure control. Like Nathan's got He's got the memory lapse, he's got the wrath of God, he's got all that stuff, card drawing, but he still has creatures. And he actually beat me um, by being able to take, well, it was the monarchy in one game and the initiative in the next. So I think we're going to see a lot of that between these two players. Yeah, I w when he cast a tutor, I was going to ask if he has balance, because that seems to be the only card that would have gotten him out of that situation. And, uh, and here it is. Yeah, so cool. The two mana, um, you know, board sweeper to be able to find it off off Demonic Tutor. Uh, really, really powerful. Yeah, and now, I mean, Gavin's got nothing, right? I mean, he's just kind of, I mean, it's two cards versus two cards, but Gavin just has a Council of Judgment. Nathan seems to have the small edge here with two threats in his hand. Yeah, that was a big draw step for Gavin, and he only found another plane. So Nathan's going to be able to fight through the council judgment over the course of a few turns. And then also importantly, both the cards that Nathan plays, they're going to leave behind a little bit of value if, uh, you know, after, after getting killed by council's judgment. Yeah. I mean, if you play the Karn, I imagine Nathan's going to make a Karn struct here and then Gavin's going to have to fire off the council's judgment, but Nathan's still going to have a two, two in play. And then if he jams that walking ballista, that's, that's a, that's a pair of three threes with that land that he drew. Oh no, he didn't. So no construct went for the card here. Oh, and that's an incredible draw here from Yavin. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Figure of Destiny. It's obviously not one of the top cards in the queue, but it's just sort of like a fun one. Um, uh, first of all, Blast from the Past, that was fun to play and constructed in the old days, but also a one-mana creature that you can get on the board early and then sometimes just dominates in, in situations like this. Although you don't... Uh, I don't take you as a as a figure of destiny player. When I think of Reed Duke, I don't think of somebody who plays a, a one mana Kithkin. Well, I, I mean, actually, funny enough, in the early days of, of playing constructed, uh, Kithkin and White Weenie were some of my favorite decks. Um, wow! And uh, I've I, I I was slow on the uptake with the red and white beatdown decks in Cube, but I've come to be like kind of a big fan of drafting monocolor aggro decks. What's cool about Figure of Destiny is if you get it early, it goes in in either of those paths, either white or red, uh, so you don't have to just, you know, guess or dive into one or the other on in, on your first pick of the draft. Yeah. And, I mean, Gavin really needs to find something here. That Walking Ballista kind of threatened to run away with this. Nathan has a bunch of mana and has nothing else to do with it other than filtering, filtering all of it into this Ballista. Hmm. That's not going to get it done. Yeah, what are your thoughts on Andrel? Drawing of the equipment post post board sweeper. Um, <laughs> Why not? And the, the hits keep coming for Nathan. Uh, uh, my thoughts on Andrel. Good question. It's clearly a really powerful card. Um, it's kind of plays a role that it's it's ambiguous if you need that role in a lot of decks. Um, so I would consider it a card that. A is really, really good with Stoneforge Mystic. I'm not sure if Gavin has that card. Um, B, good in certain types of matchups and games, like if you just kind of need that extra oomph to, to uh, win, win a slightly longer grindier game. And then a card that's never embarrassing if you, have to, if you wind up a little bit short. You know, you're trying, trying to draft a monocolor deck, so you need a couple extra playables. Um, but I could be wrong. Do you, do you like it? I, I haven't really liked it too much. And obviously, the I, I don't really care too much about the, the legendary creature clause either. I think I rem I did play it in one deck where I also had Skull Clamp and a bunch of mana creatures. I was like a okay. green, black, mid-range deck. So I had a bunch of mana elves. And it's a lot better if you can go turn one mana elf into turn two Anduril, and then maybe you can kind of go off with Skull Clamp. But yeah, it's not a card that I take early. And if I just kind of table it, then maybe I'll put it into my deck if it's okay. But uh, yeah, so, something I'm not a huge fan of. But I mean... This game's basically over here, right, Reed? 
Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, the, the exist the, the walking ballista just sticking on the battlefield is such a headache for Gavin's deck because think of him trying to rebuild, get a creature out there, get it equipped, and just knowing that basically like his next six <laughs> little creatures are going to get killed. Not to mention Nathan with all this mana making the ballista bigger and bigger each turn. So Gavin would need you know several running top decks in a row to to be able to compete in this game. Yeah, I think it starts with Path to Exile, which he does have, but couldn't find it here. So I think this is all that over. The the awkward thing about Student of Warfare is just the fact that whenever you level it up, it's also sorcery speed. So if he just tries to level it up once, I mean you just that just takes one activation from the ballista to get it down. Yeah, it's it's a horrible spot for Gavin, but you see him decide uh deciding to employ uh deploy the student of warfare just because if he doesn't, he's going to take right. 12 damage on his turn. So, Yeah, it's just like, what if I click really fast? <laughs> maybe, maybe, <laughs> yeah. it'll, maybe it'll slide through. It looks like Nathan picked like every card he could get that gives either Monarchy or Initiative. He even has a green card in his hand, the Undermountain Adventurer, um, that gives you Initiative. Yeah, I mean, Initiative just is just such... A powerful mechanic and i think anything with initiative basically just immediately catapulted itself into the anything with initiative on it i think is basically a top 30 card at this point in the cube it's just kind of wild how powerful that card is and also if you're playing a cube with a lot of initiative it also makes it so that drafting those old-fashioned control decks is a lot less viable because if one initiative creature just slips through the cracks i mean that can just be it yeah, for sure. Actually, the way my game against Nathan went was I had the old school uh, blue green big mana upheaval deck. Okay. So I did, you know, make make twelve mana upheaval, replay all my stuff. But I ended up still losing that game just because Nathan had the initiative at the time of the upheaval, and it was just too, you know, t took too many turns for me to to re-establish uh, any kind of aggression to try to take it away from him. I think they should reword because I was playing a red deck with some burn spells. They should uh they should reword initiative so that if if, if damage switches, Ooh. maybe huh? That'd be just cool. so I could be like four bolt you get it back just for a turn because I was just <laughs> sitting there. I'm like I'm just gonna die. Like I don't know what to do. Like I had four creatures in my deck. So the moment an initiative creature resolved, I was like, well, I'm I'm just going to lose. But I can at least go out, cast a time walk, have some fun, and then I'll lose. Well, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, so I know you're playing a lot of Vintage Cube. You know, I've been watching your videos on YouTube as well. And I have a question for you. Have you made a cube of your own yet? And if so, would you include initiative in it? I have not made my own cube. I think I've just been desperately playing catch up this month as I've started delving into Vintage Cube. Put it this way. I haven't drafted Vintage Cube since I started working at Wizards, which was about six and a half years ago. So wow. a lot has changed since then. You got a lot of homework, yeah. I have a lot of homework. I think I finally caught up, minus the Aklazots. I finally caught up <laughs> to most of the cards. So I think maybe now I'm kind of ready to start working on a cube. Would I include initiat initiative? That's a really good question. I'm leaning towards no, though. I think it's just a little too swingy. I think Monarch, maybe a, a little smattering of Monarch is okay. But I think having that plush initiative really warps how you should be drafting a cube. Fair enough. Yeah, I think once you do finish your cube, uh, it's going to be a fan favorite. So I'll definitely check in to see what that looks like. Uh, but probably also would make for a good YouTube. I, I I wonder that like when it comes to designing cubes, I know we've I've talked to Gavin a lot about just like what happens in the background to make sure you know that your cube is is robust and it appeals to a variety of players. But also like you know, I mean, there are some cubes that are more for fun. Would you would you go that route or would you try to make something that's like a bit more like competitively viable? I mean, there's a lot of different ways I think I would go about it. I think, there, for example, I'm kind of known to enjoy drafting myself a control cube. Uh -huh. so I could just make the just the most slow, ridiculously dirtily cube where everybody's just trying to draw cards and, and out mid-range each other. I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't like that. But then I can also just go many other directions. I think uh, that's a great thing about cube. Everybody can just build the cube the way that they like to include what they like. Because at this point, we have 30 years of magic sets to, to draw from. So there's no real wrong way to build a cube. It's just kind of, what are the, the last 50 to 60 cards in every cube is just kind of replaceable. A lot of the cards are replaceable. What do you want to do with those 60 cards is the question. Great way to put it.
And take a look at Nathan's hand here, Reed. Not a lot of action. I, I might be leading hard on that balance again. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, balance is a really powerful uh, catch-up mechanism, which you can find with Demonic Tutor, and is also particularly good when you can power out some of these mana artifacts. Um, he also has Ancestral Recall in his deck, so hmm. that alone, it's almost like I'll keep any hand with Demonic Tutor and a blue source, um, because you, know, you could just have an entirely new hand to work with by turn three if you want. But I think you're right that balance is probably going to be a default approach that Nathan might go for. Um, a cool card on, on Gavin's side is Urza's Saga. Did you have a chance to notice what Saga targets he has? I think there's a Mox Pearl. There was a Mox Pearl, and I think that's what he ended up getting against me. I don't remember if he had something else. That's the only card, yeah. Only target. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, and yeah, he played it against me. And um, I think I had a pretty decent board, so he just used it to uh, use the mana instead of making a, a construct that turn. But I, yeah, I think that's that's the only card he has. But still, an extremely powerful card. I mean, you don't need a lot. Urza Saga does not need a lot of help. Yeah, for sure. Urza Saga is also a really interesting card to play with. In particular, I find what turn do I play Urza Saga to be a really cool question. So here, Gavin chose to play it on turn two, um, despite having planes as an option. And now it seems like it makes sense for him to use the next two turns making constructs, especially knowing that he's facing a deck that could potentially have board sweepers. Uh, on the other hand, you know, Selfless Spirit's a really good card to play. If you have a board sweeper, he might just want to push extra damage with the, with the uh, figure of Destiny. So despite only a couple of cards having been deployed so far. Lots of really, really cool choices for both players. Have you ever cut Urza Saga from your deck? Like, what if you have no targets? I sometimes cut it if I have actu actual zero targets. Um, okay. But I think I would always play it if I, if I had one that I was going to play anyway. Yep. So balance in this spot, because Gavin played City of Traders... How good is it here? Because Gavin can respond and still have something left after this balance, right, Reed? Yeah, it's true. Um, he can, yeah, he can just let his creatures die and then and then start making constructs afterwards. That's probably part of the reason he did it. I wonder though, you know, that that's yet another option that Gavin had that that we didn't even get to talk about is playing the city of traders. I wonder how much. That will prove to be a, a good or a bad choice as the game goes long here. Yeah, I mean, now that Nathan killed the Urza Saga, which was going to get the Pearl, Gavin can't really play out that Wandering Emperor until he... He can't even play that Steel Seraph either, right? I, I, if you want to prototype the Seraph, doesn't it cost two white? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So he... Can, like, yeah, his choice is he could just play a mopey little Selfless Spirit, or he can... Uh, make this his one big turn where he's going to lose the the um, city of traders, and it looks like he is moving in on intrepid adversary. Which no, he's not. He is actually going to play two things instead. I have misclicked yeah. it before. I don't know if this was a misclick on his part. I have one hundred percent. I tried to cast a bloodthirsty adversary, tapped my mana, and then it came into play as a two two. I don't know if that's what happened to Gavin, but there was a little bit of a delay. He's pausing, right? Yeah, that makes me wonder the same thing. <laughs> well, this is the board. <laughs> this is the board, so. Yeah. So Gavin's kind of taking his shot, trying to push a lot of damage, get the game over with. I think it's going to work out poorly for him because Nathan can either manage this battlefield with Walking Ballista or he can trade off his Lauren and then make the play that you outlined for us of Demonic Tutor for Balance. Yeah, I mean, it's, it seems like a pretty good spot here. Although, Gavin kind of used up a lot of resources. So, I mean, Nathan is going to be discarding more cards and also will be down to two lands if he chooses to go for the balance line. Oh, it's just Ballista, though. Yeah, this seems good. I mean, how can you turn it down? You kill three opposing creatures, then you still have Demonic Tutor to get Ancestral Recall or 
you know, something that takes takes the initiative, whatever your your most powerful thing is against an opponent who has only two planes on the battlefield. Yeah, really, really tough spot here for for Gavin. I mean, Nathan immediately killing that selfless spirit can also kill the adversary. <laughs> Just killing everything. And depending, I mean, now I, Gavin need, needs to draw land. That's a good start here because now the Steel Seraph means that Gavin can get in, I suppose, with the Construct. I mean, you can just give the Containment Priest flying just to get in for extra damage. Because, But the do you think Nathan wants to keep the Ballista alive here to be able to put counters on it? My instinct is that trying to manage this battlefield by putting counters on the ballista is going to be too slow and puts Nathan at risk of getting kind of tempoed out. Um, it all depends on what he wants to do with Demonic Tutor. So this is a this is a spot where I think there's multiple paths Nathan can go down, but he just wants to make sure that he has some kind of uh, reasonable, coherent game plan and that he puts all of his resources towards that. So if he's going to uh, Demonic Tutor for let's say Wrath of God next turn, then he probably wants to just block with the Ballista and save some damage. If he's going to Demonic Tutor for a value card like Ancestral Recall, then maybe he takes a different approach. But uh, I mean, this is the fun of getting to watch, uh, you know, one of the best players in the world navigate a game where he has Demonic Tutor and his whole, you know, singleton deck of 40 cards available to him. Right. I mean, even if Nathan can just find a way to kill the Steel Seraph, that would also go a long way because all of a sudden that construct also becomes a 1-1 one -one that's in play. So then Nathan could do something like block the Containment Priest and shoot the token. But playing the land here, I don't know what exactly is in Nathan's deck. So that's what makes this more exciting, I guess. It's like, could be anything. Yeah, he definitely has board sweeper options. Um... If, if, was there get, a like, dam in the draft? Yeah, he has dam here. Okay. Um, but, okay. but that's not his choice. Wow. So can can he die here? I don't think so. He's at seven, right? So even if Gavin goes Council's Judgment, Nathan can kill off one of the two twos and then go down to two? And just a little bit of insight into what Nathan's got in his deck. I see a sideboard, Wrath of God. I mm. see uh, Vindicate. I see, uh, we, we saw Under Mountain Adventure earlier. Uh, Teferi, Hero of Dominaria. I'm just reading off cards, by the way. So uh, things like that, basically. I think um, those are the, the big ticket items. Yeah, he fetched the dam. So that's basically Wrath of God. Yeah. So this is just a block to stay alive type situation. But yeah, this is going to be just a block. Ping, ping the Containment Priest most likely, and then you go to four, and then you try to stabilize with the dam. Okay. Depending on what he draws, Nathan could choose to just use the black-black mode of dam. Um, <laughs> That's also balance. Bad. Only only a 1-1 one, one construct, and then he can deploy a wedding announcement. Uh, it seems like he's going to be fine to just cast the, the full value dam and then the wedding announcement. The problem then, that once wedding announcement hits the battlefield, balance is going to be ineffective for the rest of the game. Right. Um, the wedding announcement, you get the token at the end step, right? So you could, you could play the announcement and then balance and then get the token after. That looks pretty good to me and then keep the dam on the battlefield for the next creature, or keep sure. the dam you know, in hand. Yeah. He will have to lose, what, three of his lands here? To, Correct. To go with the balance, but I think two talismans plus uh, two triomes and the, the creeping tar pits probably. Oh! Taking every card. Right, so he could have left dam in his hand, but he's electing to basically trade that one for one for Gavin's hand, 
So now oh, we're gonna we're gonna have wedding announcement, uh, creeping tar pit, and the mana to activate it against just ap absolute absolute nothing for Gavin. Gavin does get the first draw step, so let's not call it yet. But I mean, Nathan right. swapped to a really good winning position here. Oh, that was that was awesome! Just emptying out your hand so that even if your opponent has a council judgment like the one that Gavin has, now Gavin is on just pure top deck mode versus wedding announcement and tar pit. And ooh, no! Wait, that is a top deck and a half! Oh my, okay, that wait a minute. It is a top deck, but no land just yet. Yeah, but you can imagine if Gavin finds a mana source next turn, he might just play the Dungeoneer and then attack and give it protection from creatures and win the game. I mean, it's 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 possible. Abs yeah, it's absolutely possible, but we are drawing a card here, so Nathan's going... Ooh, from the Catacombs. Oh, and he found the land! <laughs> yes! Okay. Let's go! Okay. I can't believe I'm rooting for the initiative. <laughs> Why are you? <laughs> Why are you? Game three, oh, baby, one three time! Okay. So Nathan could get <laughs> Steel Seraph for lifelink? To give a, something a, a lifelink and get up to five? You can take the initiative back? You take the initiative back so then Gab, uh, Gavin doesn't get to forage on his upkeep. Oh, March. March is great. March is looking good as well. I agree. Yeah, you can just... You, yeah, still can ponder. You can march the Dungeoneer and then still attack and get the initiative back, right? Yeah, that checks out. Not expecting a lot of haste creatures right. or uh, burn spells from Gavin's deck. Found the answer, Nathan, with that Ancestral. Oh, Gavin almost came back here. It looks like we're on track for uh, for Nathan to to knock Gavin out and make the finals. I know Gavin was kind of really looking forward to getting to enter the ring uh, with his his own cube and his own event after um, being mostly in the booth for the, the previous weeks. Um, so this was cool that he got to put on a good show for us and and make it close. Um, but it seems like Nathan's going to be uh, punching his ticket. Yeah, I mean, when we were preparing for this, he did say that um, he thought he had an 85% shot of winning the whole thing because it is his cube. So I think the 15% part happened. You know what's funny? Nathan Stoyer. Yeah. Nathan literally said, I'm the 15% when Gavin said that. Oh, did he? I, really? Yeah, he, he really he did. Won. So I, 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 it's, it's hilarious. I love trash talk. Good trash talk. It makes my uh, day. <laughs> <laughs> Man. I hope to one day win enough matcha matches that I can engage in, in trash talk with these guys. <laughs> I think you've won your fair share, Reed. I think you've won your fair share of matches. I'll tell you guys, it's tough out there. I played this uh, a handful of weeks, and it, you know, you got I got zero easy matches. Put it that way. I, I won a couple of them, but for the most part, it was like you know scraping, like zero one, one one. I mean, look, they get some pretty pretty awesome lineups for this. Is it's almost like what you would expect out of a PT top eight, right? It's, it's pretty close. There's a lot of, I mean, you, you got your hall of famers here. We got you on here. Sometimes we have the two LSVs we have. I mean, there's just a lot of, lot of great competition in the, in these, uh, in these drafts. All right. And speaking of great competition, that is Nathan Stoyer defeating Gavin Thompson.